BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan, and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube, and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. All right, hello everybody. Today is Friday, another Anything Goes Friday. Welcome to the show. How's everybody doing? So, this is a topic that a lot of people have requested over the past three months, and even going back before that, a lot of people wanted to hear about the Jack the Ripper suspect, Charles Lechmere, but specifically in the last three months, a lot of you guys in the comments section requested a direct response to the YouTube channel, House of Lechmere, and that is what I will be sharing with you today. Just a couple quick announcements before that. The first is that there is an ongoing series about the Phantom Killer available on this channel, and I will be doing the concluding episode in that one next Wednesday. And I do a regular weekend segment about the murder of Jean Benet Ramsey, and if all goes well, that should be coming out this weekend. But before I respond to the videos that have been made available, on the House of Lishmere YouTube channel, I would like to go over to jacktheripper.org and give us the most basic introduction as to who was Charles Lechmere. And even before that, I'll just say some of the basics. Jack the Ripper was a serial killer who committed a very gruesome crime spree in England back in 1888, and his crimes are also known as the Whitechapel Murders. The first crime occurred on August 31st of 1888 with the murder of Polly Nichols, and the final crime was on November 9th of 1888 with the murder of Mary Kelly. But to go to jacktheripper.org, Jack Charles Lechmere was also known as Charles Cross, and he was born in the parish of St. Anne Soho in 1849. His father was John Allen Lechmere, and his mother was Mary Louisa Lechmere. Following her husband's death, Mary married Constable Thomas Cross, although Charles continued using the name Lichmere, He, for some reason, chose to give his name as Cross when he reported the fact that he had found the body of Marianne Nichols. And yes, Marianne Nichols was the first victim, but she is commonly known as Polly, and I will be referring to her as Polly, except when I'm going to be reading some quotations like that, where she's listed as Mary or Marianne. The man who found Mary Nichols, just to recap, Charles Cross was the local carman or carter in modern-day parlance, a driver or porter of removals man, who, whilst he was on his way to work at 3.40 a.m. on August 31st of 1888, passed along Bucks Row and had the misfortune to stumble upon the body of Mary Nichols, the woman who was genuinely accepted to have been the first victim of Jack the Ripper. Or at least that's the story that he told the police, and that's what he stated at the inquest into his death of Mary Nichols. And pretty convincing he must have been to, since the police, including coroner, Wynn Baxter, the inquest jury, the newspapers, and not to mention the generations of amateur sleuths and ripperologists down the years, had been content to accept his version of the events. The general consensus had always been that Cross had the misfortune to stumble upon the body of Jack the Ripper's first victim, as he made his way to work. Now this is where the true material shared in the House of Lichmer videos begins, and I would like to give a big uh, credit to Edward Stowe for creating all of this content that I'm going to be responding to. And if you do watch the YouTube series House of Lichmer, it is about someone sharing their theory involving the Jack the Ripper case, zoning in on a particular suspect, and it's like a true crime walk and talk where 
the um, locations are being narrated and you can actually see the modern day um, locations as they've evolved over time. But also on the screen are direct quotations from the newspaper articles and the coverage of the time so you can see that the presenter is not making it up. One more time on the House of Lichmere YouTube channel. And this is where things get rather interesting because Charles Lichmere is not the only person who finds the body of Polly Nichols. There is another witness named Robert Paul who is also happening upon this situation. But as I understood the narrative, it appears that Lichmere is the person who is seen closest to the body and then Robert Paul is perhaps the second witness. And they even talked about this on the House of Lichmere series that it created some confusion, rather, that there was some type of um, insinuation that they found the body at the same time, therefore Charles Lichmere would have had an alibi. Well, he was just seen by an innocent bystander walking for an extended period of time, so he couldn't have been the killer. But if he is seen at the body, seen by the body first by himself, well, that creates a discrepancy in the timeline. And the explanation that was provided by Charles Lechmere is that he was indeed walking to work, and he saw what he thought was a tarpaulin. I'll just call it a tarp because I don't have an English accent, so it doesn't sound as charming when I say it the other way. So he, saw, he thought that he saw a tarp, and that was actually the body of Polly Nichols because her skirt had been pulled up. But it was um, not a tarp at all. And I think that there was a particular insinuation in the House of Lichmere videos, and that is that this guy, Charles Lichmere, was someone who was described as hardworking. He was someone who was described as perhaps honest and confident, and people believed his story. And also, the insinuation is that he was very clever, and hypothetically, if he were the Ripper, that his lies were accepted and in somewhat of a very meticulous way. Like, he's telling these lies for a reason because he thought that he saw a tarp on the street. So then people jumped to conclusions and added on fictitious layers to that. Oh, well, he was going over to salvage the tarp, to take it for himself. And instead of challenging his story, they're adding details onto it. And the presenter didn't say the exact thing in um, that series of videos, but that's what I felt was heavily implied by, by the entirety of Lichmere's presentation. But you see very clearly he goes from being a witness in the Jack the Ripper case, someone who um, discovers one of the bodies, to being a suspect and being accused of being the Ripper himself entirely. All right, so what does this mean? Like, what, what does this mean? I talk a lot about the Zodiac Killer here on Black Box Online Radio, and back in 2020, I issued an open challenge to anyone who was proposing a Zodiac Killer suspect, and that is, how do you get your suspect to the crime scenes? Like, how can you state that your suspect would have had access to the crime scenes? Because the Zodiac Killer and Jack the Ripper are very similar. With the Jack the Ripper case, I do give credit to um, this uh, theory involving Charles Lechmere, whether it's done by Edward Stowe or by anybody else who thinks that he was the Ripper. He is f found at the crime scene. He is found at the site of the murder of Polly Nichols. So that definitely um, checks one box. And not only that, that the crimes would have been, would have occurred in areas that he would have been familiar about because of his walking path to work. In one of the earliest segments of the House of Lichmere videos, it talks about how he moved to the area in June of 1888, but the crimes did not start until August of 1888. And there, the word climatized was used. It's almost as if he was becoming climatized to the area before he started committing the crimes. And I don't think that that had anything to do with the weather or the seasons or the actual climate, I think it meant that a serial killer, such as Jack the Ripper, like many people have thought for a long time, is expected to have been very familiar with the area, and moving in on June 12th, 1888, or whatever it was, 
well, he's not going to commit a crime on June 13th, because in those roughly two months that he would have had, or actually it's, it's almost three months then, because it's August 31st, so in those two and a half, three months that he would have had living there, he could have become familiar with all of the dark alleyways, all of the passages, all of the ways to sneak around, because if somebody were committing a crime like this, a crime like the Whitechapel murders, then they were doing it on unfamiliar territory. Well, they're going to commit a murder, and then they're going to run the other way, and then they're just going to run in a dead end, and they're going to be trapped, and they could easily be caught. So that is also something that is in favor of Charles Lechmere being a Jack the Ripper suspect. And I think, though, that you guys are probably going to be very curious about what would be some challenges to this theory involving Charles Lichmere. Well, the first is, something shared by Edward Stowe in the presentation, that there's this other witness, Robert Pohl, who notices the body of Polly Nichols, and then these two men are together, and Pohl suggests that they prop her body up, and Charles Lichmere says no, like he, he doesn't agree with the idea to prop her body up because Paul thinks that there's a chance that she's still alive. He might have even seen some sign of life, or what he perceived to be the sign of life. I mean, those are two different things. But his perception of it could be thinking that maybe she's still alive and he wants to raise her body. And Lichmere says no. And the reason that was provided in the House of Lichmere series is that's because Charles Lichmere knew that her throat had been slashed. And that, of course, um, she would bleed out in a particular way, or that, I mean, it, it would um, disfigure the body and make it even more gruesome, but also about getting blood everywhere, or it would even just exacerbate that cut on her throat and that her head would go in an undesirable direction. So I have a very big exception with that. I mean, I know that it's stated as a possibility but that's not the only possibility. That's not the only reason why somebody would say something like that. And in fact, I don't even think that's a, a good reason. Anyone who has even the most basic amount of medical knowledge would probably say something similar. I am not a doctor, being very honest with you. We're talking maybe first aid merit badge and the Boy Scouts. And I would have said the same thing. Oh, I think we should uh, lift her up. No, Oh, I think we should try and sit her up. No. And um, to be honest with you, I didn't hear about this in First Aid Merit Badge and the Boy Scouts. I heard about it on the football team. They said, if your teammate is ever injured on the field and can't get up on his own, do not help him up. Wait for the trainers or medical staff because you could be making the injury worse. So... I mean, was Lichmere thinking like that? I have no idea. But instinct alone could tell some people not to do that, let alone the fact that this woman would have been bleeding. And by Robert Paul's own admission, it was rather visible, like, because there's this idea that Jack the Ripper is only operating in pitch black and in total darkness. And if you look at a lot of the illustrations of Jack the Ripper, you'll see just these dark alleyways and... There isn't even any light. Maybe Jack the Ripper is carrying a candle or something because they don't even have street lamps. But according to the um, House of Lichmere presentation and the testimony from Paul, that it was a rather there were rather rather visible conditions and that you could see rather clearly. So they probably could tell that she was very bloody. Maybe he just didn't even want to touch her bloody body, and that shouldn't be viewed as any type of significance of someone's guilt or innocence, because someone said, oh, let's prop her up, oh, let's uh, try to sit her up, and he's like, no, let's not do that. That's not evidence, and I don't think that that even suggests guilt in any single way. The second point is one that's a little bit more important. Charles Lichmere used an alias, Charles Cross, and... He did this after Paul gives an interview in with a newspaper, and he, and he talks about how there was another person who was identified, or another person who was at the crime scene, another witness. And what happens is that Charles Lichmere has not said anything about the murder of Polly Nichols for three and a half days, 
But after he's mentioned in this newspaper as the other witness, just, a, just that there is another witness, when he goes public, he gives the name Charles Cross. And for the longest time, he was actually known to the world of Ripperology as Charles Cross. But what happened was people were able to track down the actual address that he had and found out that he was indeed Charles Lichmere, that Charles Lichmere was his legal name. Charles Cross was... um. An alias, but the name Cross came from his stepfather, as previously stated. And then, again, this is being used as a point of evidence in favor of his guilt, because he used this alias Charles Cross. Absolutely not. I don't think that there's anything significant about using an alias, why that should signify guilt or innocence. Because, by by the presenter's own admission in the House of Lichmere series, Lots of people used aliases at the time. There was no internet, there were no electronic databases, and he provided examples about how sometimes criminals used aliases, and sometimes independents, free-working people used aliases. Now, I'm going to offer you guys a different possibility, a different reason. Why would somebody give... A different name. Why wouldn't somebody give their legal name when they're talking about a murder? I mean, you might be thinking, oh, well, that's because they're guilty, right? The only reason someone's going to use an alias is when they're guilty, right? No, I don't think so. Here's the alternative, poly the alternative possibility. Privacy. Some people just simply don't want to be bothered. Some people simply do not want to talk about situations, especially something like discovering a mutilated corpse at 3.40 in the morning while they're walking to work. So that I also felt was something that is often, well, it comes up all the time in these discussions on Charles Litchmere and even in the comment section on Black Box Online Radio, I've reading, been reading about people debating about whether or not using the name Charles Cross should signify guilt or innocence. I think it should just be stricken from the record. I don't see anything weird about that. And you're going to have to do a lot more than that. Using an alias doesn't make you a murderer. The things that I think are in favor of Charles Lichmere's guilt would be that he was in the vicinity, he was on a walking path that would have given him access to multiple crime scenes. And to um, be very clear, I've been, this is a response to the House of Lichmere video series, and it appears to be ongoing because most of the material is talking about the first two crimes, and I'm quite curious what this presenter, Edward Stowe, is going to say about some of the other Ripper crimes, particularly the murder of Liz Stride, the murder of Catherine Eddowes, and, of course, the murder of Mary Kelly, but most notably the double event, because Liz Stride and Catherine Eddowes were murdered on the same night. Believe it or not, I actually think that the info that was shared on Wikipedia was rather interesting in terms of how they chose to um, arrange it. So I'm going to read something for you, you guys right here, and then I'm going to respond to it. Charles Allen Lichmere, also known as Charles Cross, was a carman or cart driver from the east side of London who worked for the Pickford Company for more than 20 years. He is suspected to have been Jack the Ripper. Charles Claw Cross was long regarded as merely the innocent witness who discovered the body of Mary Ann Nichols, the first of the Ripper's five canonical victims, while on his way to work. The suggestion might actually be that the Whitechapel murderer first was first raised by... Oh, sorry, the suggestion that he might actually be the Whitechapel murderer was first raised by Derek Osborne in 2000 in an issue of Ripperana. And this was also discussed in House of Lichmere that um, for more than a century, people just overlooked this, or they were content with just thinking that Charles Lichmere, Charles Cross, he was just a witness. And I don't always like the concept of how okay, somebody was a witness, therefore they have to be an active participant. Sometimes people are murdered, especially like the Ripper crimes, where the bodies would have been found in very, very public places, and the killer is not going through to great extremes to try and move the bodies. So, 
The um, following year, the possibility was furthered in an article by John Kerry, while Osborne went on to examine a set of remarkable coincidences which suggested that Cross was in fact a man legally known as Lichmere. And what they talked about was um, his address was written down by one of the papers, which was actually the Star. The Star was, um, well, I'm not going to get into too much about them, but they're one of the publications at the time, and they wrote down his address correctly. And that um, because the address had been noted correctly, and the uh, presenter, um, Edward Stowe, had this whole theory about how the reporter most likely talked to the court usher and got the address right. So then they were able to trace that back to, um, well, who was living there at the time, and then they found that his legal name was Lichmere and not Charles Cross. Mainstream awareness of Lichmere grew in 2014 when journalist Char Christopher Holmgren, criminologist Gareth North, and others explored the case against him in the 2014 Channel 5 documentary Jack the Ripper, The Missing Evidence. In 2021, Holmgren produced a book in which Lichmere is linked not only to the Whitechapel murders, but also to the longer series of killings known as the Thames Torso Murders. In Lichmere's testimony to the Nichols inquest, he claimed that he was walking to work down Bucks Row when he discovered the body of Marianne Nichols, also known as Polly, lying next to a gateway. Robert Paul, who was walking some distance behind, first noticed him standing where the woman was. After he saw Paul, Lichmere brought him over to look at the woman. No blood was described by either man, but by the time a constable found Nichols shortly afterwards, blood had pooled around her neck suggesting to some that her throat had been cut and was very fresh. I mean, that is, um, I think, though, that is, like, they must have been able to notice blood at some point if there were other wounds. I mean, and this has also been talked about by a lot of people, and even in the comments section and on House of Lichmere, and that is that if the victims were strangled first, this reduces um, the arterial spray, or this reduces the um, amount of blood flow and the victim that was not um, strangled first was Liz Stride. I think it was Shaper Art in the comments section who wrote this out first um, in the comments, and that was saying that she wasn't strangled first, therefore when her throat was slashed, there was actually more blood at Liz Stride's murder than there would have been at Polly Nichols's murder. But, um, I mean, if they were so close to the, or the point where they're considering propping her up, then... Um, they must have noticed some type of, some amount of blood, and I don't really care how dark it is, but I still stand by that point. If you think that someone is injured, you don't lift them up because, well, you could be making the injury worse, and um, absolutely stand by that point because it has nothing to do with the amount of blood that you're seeing. It's that you don't move an injured person if you're not a medical professional because you don't know what's wrong. Lichmere and Paul were present. In addition, neither man reported seeing or hearing anyone else at Bucks Row, which had no side exits. And this was also covered in the House of Lichmere series, that there are even some people who really try to be poetic and crafty with their wording, telling the story that Charles uh, Cross, as he was referred to in one account, was got up and walked around, and he was listening for sounds on a rather quiet night, and it was unusually quiet for that city street and the, the simple response was that there is no report of Charles Edgemere getting up and walking around listening for sounds, and that it wasn't an unusually quiet night. It was actually almost always a quiet street. It is therefore speculated that Charles Lichmere may have murdered Nichols and begun mutilating her body when he suddenly heard the sound of Paul's footsteps, and then he rapidly pulled down her clothing to cover up the wounds and portrayed himself as the discoverer of the body. The 2014 documentary also points out that Lichmere did not appear at the inquest until after Paul had been quoted in the press to the effect that another man had been present. That's exactly what I was talking about. At the inquest, Lichmere gave his name as Cross, or Charles Cross, the surname of his long-dead stepfather. Investigators found that no one named Cross was listed in the census records for the address he supplied, meaning that his true identity was not known for over a century. And stand by my claim as well. I don't think there's anything weird about that. I mean, maybe somebody doesn't want to become a public figure. Maybe somebody doesn't want to talk about this at all, finding a dead body in the streets with a, who has a, a slashed throat. And But see, how? I mean, how can you just come to that conclusion that the only reason why he didn't want to lift her body up is because he knew that her throat had been slashed? I just I just think that that is too much of a 
well, too much of jumping to conclusions. The location of Lichmer's home, family, and place of work put him in the vicinity of several Ripper murders and other extra-canonical killings. Holmgren notes that geographic profiling developed decades after the Ripper murders can help narrow down likely suspects by analyzing their established movements, their habitual locations, in comparison to the crime scenes. Sure, absolutely, that's like geographic profiling. Criminals tend to strike in areas that are not too close to home, yet which they are somewhat familiar and comfortable with. Given this data, Holmgren argues Lichmere is the most plausible suspect for the Ripper murders. Lichmere's logical shortest routes to work, one passing down Hanbury Street, the other down Old Montague Street, would have, would have Lichmere passed nearby streets around the same times as Martha Tavram and Polly Nichols and Annie Chapman. So Martha Tavram was um, not one of the confirmed Ripper victims. I've been meaning to do an episode purely on her murder because I've talked about um, all the previous uh, Ripper victims, not exactly in standalone episodes. The first one I ever did was called The Murder of Long Liz Stride, who was, um, well, the third Ripper victim, although it's quite possible that the Ripper didn't actually murder her. I mean, that he simply took credit for it with the Saucy Jackie postcard, which is a communication. And here's something that's very interesting about Jack the Ripper and Charles Lichmere. I said that the House of Lichmere is an ongoing series, yet all of these things that have vilified him so far have taken place before the birth of Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper doesn't come into focus until the Dear Boss letter, I mean the name, the persona of Jack the Ripper. There isn't exactly something that is left after the murder of Polly Nichols, like a name written in blood saying Jack was here or something like that. So... So, um, the murders of Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes on the same night, the so-called double event, took place fur further south in, and in the small hours of a Sunday, likely the only day Lichmere would not have been traveling to and from work, and Liz Stride was killed in the proximity of his mother's house and in the area where he grew up. See, I know that's the stuff that gives you those bone-chilling feelings. You're like, oh my gosh, this is starting to get weird now. But I've said it once and I'll say it again. It is inappropriate to investigate a true crime case with the whole concept of, oh, I had this real creepy feeling and now I'm going to look for five or six coincidences that support that creepy feeling that I had the first time. No, that's an impractical method. But oh yes, that is indeed creepy. And... This was, an, this was in a locality in which Eddowes was murdered, which would have been well known to him as it was on the logical route to Broad Street from at least one of his earlier addresses. Mary Jane Kelly was murdered near the northernmost route to his work, and the time frame in which she is estimated to have been killed is reconcilable which is presu which, with his presumed journey. Although the day she was killed was a holiday, and he may or may not have had the day off. So the conclusion that I will share with you guys is this is definitely not going to be the first episode on Charles Lechmere. There's a lot more to explore. This is more or less an introduction, but I don't think that he is the worst Jack the Ripper suspect. I'm kind of about 50-50 giving him like a 5 out of 10 in terms of likelihood of being the Ripper. The proximity to the victims, absolutely, absolutely that's a big one. Access to these crime scenes, absolutely, that's a big one. Being seen by one of the bodies, the first person to find Polly Nichols's body, absolutely, that's a big one. And to be to be fair, when it talks about how there's this other witness, Robert Pohl, according to the House of Lichmere series, there was an eight-minute discrepancy when, um, I mean, the two people should have been walking, and then he is more or less unaccounted for for eight minutes, and that's, that could have been the time when he was committing the murder. I follow all of that. So those things do mount up. But um, the points that I did state about using the alias and not wanting to touch her body or not wanting to prop her up or anything or hold her up, I don't think that that is anything odd. I think, that is also, I think that's purely consistent as just as easily with someone who is innocent, and that doesn't strike me as suspicious in the least way. But what do you think? You can put your ideas in the comment section down below. What do you think about Charles Lichmere as a Jack the Ripper suspect? And if you disagree with my comments, you can you you can share your reasons why. And I think that what's most fascinating, and it's just I didn't expect that it was going to end up like this. That 
after watching the House of Lichmere videos that everything is going to be about the crimes and not about the letters at all. I mean, we haven't even really talked about the Dear Boss letter. I mentioned the Saucy Jackie postcard. I didn't even mention the From Hell letter. And this is more focusing on the activities of the criminal rather than the letter writer. But please feel free to put your ideas in the comment section down below. Anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. And there is always blackboxnid88 over on Instagram. And I will see you there for the bonus podcast. Until next time.